In this video, I will share with you two stories. One will be the tale of a four-chapter graphic novel that sought to interweave and recontextualize the universes of pop culture's longest-running canon with a satiric mirror of that very same canon. The other will be the historic fictitious recount of a Chinese spy for the German government during World War I by an Argentine author from almost 80 years ago. These stories, much like time, will have parallels, diverge, and converge in terms of their themes, structure, and execution. And while you may leave this video with a variety of takeaways, I hope that one of them will be that you should always be considerate of the time that you have and the time that you don't. Following one year from DC Comics' Rebirth relaunch in 2016, Batman and the Flash writers Tom King and Joshua Williamson teamed up to provide a follow-up story to the highly anticipated integration of the Watchmen universe to the mainline DC Comics universe. These next steps in storytelling came in the form of The Button, a four-chapter detective story that sought to explore the origins of the comedian's button following the DC Universe Rebirth one-shot from a year prior. King and Williamson's highly anticipated collab followed the adventures of Batman and the Flash as they find themselves attacked by reverse Flash villain Eobard Thawne, whisked through the time stream to be forcibly thrown into dystopia, and ultimately forced to flee back into the chaos of the time stream in an attempt to escape an already deteriorating reality. By the end of their adventure, neither one of the heroes is all too sure of what they've just been through and have furthermore lost the very artifact that they've sought to unravel, the button. There's still a powerful, looming threat to their world, and they have the capacity to reshape not only their universe, but their time. The graphic novel was widely received with praise and love, even if it didn't actually address the big questions and concerns fans had about the integration of the Watchmen into the mainline DC canon. But regardless, the charming homages, the return to the beloved dystopia of the Flashpoint event, and the exploration of how time has been restructured in the latest DC canon, definitely kept readers satisfied and looking forward to the follow-up confrontation between the Watchmen and the DC universes. The Button was one of the most widely anticipated explorations into the DC multiverse in recent years, and despite only covering four issues, it still managed to entertain and refer to the enigmatically tantalizing implications that the time stream has on the very fabric of multiversity. And with a sort of self-aware charm, the graphic novel ends with one of the most famous lines of the near-omnipotent Watchmen character, Dr. Manhattan. Why does my perception of time distress you? Everything is preordained. Even my responses. We're all puppets, Lori. I'm just a puppet that can see the strings. Through its plot devices, themes, and motifs, it comes across very clearly that time, rather than the button, was the main subject of the story. And while the story doesn't seem to explicitly elaborate on the significance of time in its plot, a separate story that arguably grandfathers the events of the button, certainly does. In 1941, a man in Argentina had taken the time to publish a garden. But before I go on to talk about that garden, it's important that I talk about the man who published the garden. Jorge Luis Borges was an essayist, a poet, and a librarian for many years before the time he had presented the world with his garden. And even during his childhood, he had the privilege of growing up with a library cataloging thousands of works in his very own home. From this bibliophilic upbringing, 
Borges had the luxury of not only reading the works of the up-and-coming South American writers of his era, but also learning about the magnum opera of cultures across the globe. He was intimately fascinated by A Thousand and One Arabian Nights, well-versed in the themes and philosophies of Golden Age Spanish literature, and even poured over Shakespeare's English plays by age 12. All of this is to say that Borges was a man who grew up reading a wide variety of genres from a wide variety of cultures, as well as with a wide variety of storytelling styles. And all of this is meant to contextualize why this Argentine man from the 1940s had decided to publish a garden. Now, this garden, I continue to refer to, is in fact a short story called The Garden of Forking Paths. The short story is a mystery thriller, presented as historical fiction, while dealing heavily with themes of science fiction at its core. And while this may sound like it all makes for a mess of a story, The Garden of Forking Paths has continued to be one of the most widely appreciated works of Spanish literature to date for its innovation, humanity, and wit. The Garden of Forking Paths takes place during World War I, and it tells the story of Yu Tsun, a Chinese man working in Britain, but as a spy for the Imperial German government to help defeat the Allied powers. The reader follows Yu Tsun as he tries to escape an officer of the British intelligence and communicate vital military secrets to Berlin in a last-ditch effort. However, Yu Tsun's chase ends up taking him to the doorstep of an English professor of Chinese culture named Stephen Albert. By pure chance, this professor has dedicated much of his life to studying the work of Yu Tsun's grandfather, Sui Pen. Sui Pen was a Chinese governor who had abandoned his political power to pursue two great tasks. The creation of a magnificent novel to crown all of Chinese literature, and the construction of a labyrinth that would entomb any man who wandered into it lost. However, in actuality, Sweet Pen's novel came across as a litany of unfinished drafts with no cohesion, and his famed labyrinth was never really found. Yu Tsun takes the time to listen to the professor and learn more about his ancestors' works. Upon entering Professor Albert's home, Yu Tsun is introduced to the magnificent labyrinth of Sweet Pen's legacy, the very same confusing and contradictory novel that had become an embarrassment to the ex-governor's reputation. And this is when we are introduced to the garden of forking paths within the story. Professor Albert reads aloud a letter he had encountered by the late Sweet Pen. I leave to various future times, but not all, my garden of forking paths. From these few words, the professor goes on to conclude, The Garden of Forking Paths was the chaotic novel itself. The phrase, to various future times, but not all, suggests the image of forking paths in time, not in space. In all of fiction, when a man is faced with alternatives, he chooses one at the expense of others. In the almost unfathomable sweet pens, he chooses, simultaneously, all of them. He thus creates various futures, various times, which start others that will in turn branch out and fork paths in other times. This is the cause of the contradictions in the novel. I'm going to end my description of the story's plot here, partly because this interpretation by Professor Albert is the key theme I'd like to discuss, but also partly because the ending of the story is such a witty and clever plot twist that I'd rather encourage anybody who has the time to read it for themselves. Link in the description. Now, to any modern day reader, this storytelling device that Professor Albert describes, the way that a character's decisions lead to alternate realities, might come across as basic multiversal storytelling. It's been the foundation for much of comic book sci-fi for decades, and has become a pretty mainstream idea in recent years. However, Borges' publication of The Garden of Forking Paths precedes the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics and multiversal possibility by over a decade. Jorge Luis Borges 
was one of the first people to formally posit the idea that decision making leads to alternate realities that can coincide. And if Professor Albert's words are to be believed, then it may be because of the cultural perceptions and receptions towards traditional storytelling that Borges creatively introduced this idea before physicists had even posited the notion. The Garden of Forking Paths is a picture, incomplete, yet not false, of the universe such as Sweet Pen conceived it to be. Differing from Newton and Schopenhauer, your ancestor did not think of time as absolute and uniform. He believed in an infinite series of times, in a dizzily growing, ever-spreading network of diverging, converging, and parallel times. By investigating the interpretations of life, time, and existence from a variety of cultures, rather than only learning from the institutionalized pinnacles of Western thought, Borges attributes this understanding of the mechanics of time to his long-held infatuation with the literature and philosophies of diverse cultures from across the world. And while there's a larger lesson to be learned about how the diversity of thought and interpretations has the capacity to accelerate societal progress, I'd rather focus the scope of this takeaway down to a discussion on how alternative storytelling styles can shape one's opinion of a novel. So far, I've gone over one of the most anticipated explorations into multiversal storytelling in recent years, The Button. And the arguable grandfather of multiversal storytelling as a genre, The Garden. Both stories revolve around the subject of time, but what are they necessarily saying about it? To start off, there's no definitive answer to that question, and I don't believe it does any good to pretend that there is. These stories can and should be read and reread by a wide variety of people who reach their own separate conclusions to take away from these stories. But for the purpose of this video, I'd like to share mine. Back in 2017, when the final chapter of The Button had just come out, I found it to be immensely disappointing. I was frustrated by how no conclusive answers were given to the significance of the comedian's button and I found the resurrection of Jay Garrick to be so short-lived that it might as well not have happened at all. For a good number of months, the whole story just left a bad taste in my mouth. However, during this time, I was in the middle of pursuing my degree in Spanish literature. And for one of my assignments, I was tasked with rereading The Garden of Forking Paths by Jorge Luis Borges. After going through the predecessor to multiversal fiction, I decided to give the button a second chance by rereading it through the Borgesian lens and perspectives that the Garden of Forking Paths presented. And I found the button to be a far more endearing and meaningful story as a result. Through the lens of Borges' themes, the button was less a science fiction detective story, but more of a reunion of times that could have been. A more fitting name for the story? might be the reunion of Forking Paths, for how we watch as both Bruce Wayne and his father are given the opportunity to meet at last across their respective timelines, for how we watch as our heroes diverge and reconverge with the Reverse Flash by pure chance throughout their adventure, and for how we get the opportunity to watch as the fathers of DC's comic book multiverse, Barry Allen and Jay Garrick, try to save each other and the chaos of the time stream. These three important events to the plot of the button see the convergence of three landmark schisms in the DC timeline up to this point. There are several other charming similarities and parallels between the button and the garden I'd love to go on about, but one of the takeaways from both stories that I feel to be most clearly enunciated is that what is and what could have been are always walking alongside us despite feeling like they should be so far gone and away. In the button, 
This concept is illustrated through Bruce Wayne's reunion with his Flashpoint father, Thomas Wayne. Two men who've lost each other decades ago had turned out to have been living and going on with their lives in just parallel spaces apart. Meanwhile, in the garden, this same concept is described in prose at the climax of the story, when Yutsun describes his enlightenment to his ancestors' perception of time. It seemed to me that the dew-damp garden surrounding the house was infinitely saturated with invisible people. All were Albert and myself, secretive, busy, and multiform in other dimensions of time. I lifted my eyes, and the short nightmare disappeared. It's an honestly comforting way of looking at the world. A philosophy where the mistakes we've made and the regrets we have feel a lot less heavy by knowing that things are more alright somewhen else. Borges, as an author, grapples very frequently with destiny as a subject. In a separate short story, Death and the Compass, Borges tells the tale of a detective trying to solve a spring of connected murders, only to ultimately succumb to a sort of destiny that he could not have deducted or seen coming. The Garden story similarly plays with the idea of destiny by presenting a framework wherein everything that can happen will happen, but ironically presenting this perception of time in a history book which has a tendency to embalm and represent the events of time in such a way that lends a reader's interpretation towards the fallacy of thinking that these events were the only way things could have turned out. They present the events as a retrospective destiny. Meanwhile, in the button, the idea of destiny is presented as a sort of ominous and ultimate inevitability, with Dr. Manhattan's famous quote, Everything is preordained. Even my responses. We're all puppets, Lori. I'm just a puppet who can see the strings. Dr. Manhattan reminds both characters and the reader of the inescapable presence of destiny in the universe. However, logically speaking, the presence of a multiverse that's based on the decisions people make and the vicissitudes of life very much flies in the face of the idea of destiny. Destiny either insists that only one string of decisions and events will happen in the universe, or that only one point in time is guaranteed to happen during the lifespan of time. Whereas a multiverse presents infinite permutations and possibilities in time, there's an essential dissonance between multiversity and destiny. Borges as a writer took note of this irreconcilability between the two concepts. And even now, we find ourselves with the same thematic battle in the button as a being who can reshape time tries to manipulate the vast infinities that come with the DC universe. It's charming to see the same questions and wonderings of the grandfather of multiversal fiction still being contemplated and considered in the modern age of the genre. I can't say for certain that we'll see any firm or decisive answers to the curiosities Borges posed, but either way, I do look forward to the advancements and breakthroughs in the genre that will surely come in time. <laughs>